Today, buying the dip as risks rise again. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's weekly market review, we toured the major markets to see what happened this week. And overall, the markets are in dip buying mode, even as inflation roars higher and rate hikes are likely to be more aggressive. New York Fed President John Williams said that if the central bank needs to raise rates by half a point, it should reinforcing comments by Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and other officials over the past week. The Fed's steps to contain inflation are what ultimately will drive a more aggressive inversion of the yield curve, which we think is coming quite quickly, Columbia Threadneedle Investments Global Head of Fixed Income Gene Tezeo told Bloomberg. But that doesn't necessarily signal a recession since this is a very different cycle and the first one in over 30 years where the Fed is playing catch up to inflation, he added, despite the strong correlation in the past, as I discussed the other day, between recessions and inversions. Economists at both Citibank and the Bank of America say they now expect the Fed to lift its key rate in multiple 50 basis point increments. The Bank of America joined a small but growing number of top investment banks calling for such aggressive interest rate increases from the Fed against the backdrop of soaring inflation data. The bank now expects two hikes of 50 basis points each at its June and July meetings, with risks of those expectations being pulled forward into May and June, respectively. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans was the latest US policymaker to sound more hawkish, saying on Thursday the Fed needs to raise interest rates in a timely fashion this year and in 2023 to curb high inflation before it's embedded in US psychology and becomes even harder to get rid of. We now look for the Fed to raise rates by 50 basis points at both its May and June meetings, with 25 basis point rate hikes penciled in at the other meetings over the balance of the year, Morgan Stanley said in a note. But they all suggested that fast Fed action was not overly concerning for the economy. While a disorderly tightening of financial conditions remains a risk to the outlook, particularly in areas like credit, our baseline growth outlook remains constructive, they wrote. We think it helps contain risks that financial conditions become too dislocated in response to the Fed's actions. Markets expect US interest rates to rise by as much as 190 basis points in total over the rest of this year after the 25 basis point hike last week. Investors are assigning an approximately 77% probability to a 50 basis point hike in March. And US Treasury yields continue to climb with the 10 year yield briefly topping 2.5% for the first time in nearly three years as Wall Street raises bets on steeper Fed rate hikes at upcoming meetings. The Federal Reserve is currently embarking on a campaign to substantially hike overnight lending rates to combat surging inflationary pressure. The premise is that by hiking interest rates, economic growth will slow, thereby quelling inflationary pressures. But of course, if those inflationary pressures are being driven directly by supply chain disruptions, it may not work. In isolation, the Fed rate hikes may not pose a significant threat to either the economy or the stock market. But the surge in inflationary pressures caused by a massive dump of government liquidity and a surge in bond yields, both short and long term, are already tightening monetary policy. Yields on benchmark two and 10 year US Treasury notes jumped to almost three year highs on Friday as the market anticipates inflation will spiral higher, forcing the Fed to aggressively hike interest rates. The 10 year Treasury yield sat at 2.488%, a rate last seen in early May 2019, and the two-year yield, which typically moves in step with interest rate expectations, was at 2.2843%, a rate also last seen in early May 2019. In fact, the surge in two-year bond yields is unprecedented. Historically, such a surge in short-term yields coincides with either recessions or market events. With yields now four standard deviations above their 52-week moving average, such has traditionally noted peaks in yields previously. The current surge in bond yields has taken the 10-year bond to extremely oversold levels, 
As with the two-year rate, the 10-year is now four standard deviations above its 52-week moving average. It's also approaching the top of the long-term downtrend channel from 1980. But notably, people don't buy houses or cars, they actually buy payments. Payments are a function of interest rates, and when interest rates rise, loan activity falls as payments rise above affordability. In an economy where 70% of Americans have little savings, higher payments significantly impact family budgets. So it's important to understand that high interest rates create demand destruction. Therefore, as rates increase to the point that something breaks, the deflationary impact will quickly slow, will quickly show in commodity prices. So the most significant risk to the Fed is that hiking rates will exacerbate the economic drag. With yield curves heading towards inversion, as I discussed the other day, and such inversions historically suggest we are closer to a recession than not. Now, some will suggest the surge in bond yields has created another historic opportunity to buy bonds at a deeply discounted price. Just as investors don't want to buy stocks at the bottom of a bear market, they don't want to buy bonds for the same reason. However, history has repeatedly shown that some of the best bond buying opportunities have come when investors are sure this time is different. The reality is rates can't rise much before the impact on economic growth leads to a crisis, recession or bear market. Such is the problem of a heavily indebted and leveraged economy. In the wake of red hot inflation, the consumer, the backbone of the US economy, continues to grow wary, with many keeping a closer eye on whether spending is likely to be reined in. The University of Michigan's sentiment index showed US consumer sentiment deteriorated further in late March, falling to a reading of 59.4 from 59.7 earlier in the month. The University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index, the MCSI, ended March 2022 at 59.4, that's down 0.5% from the previous decade-long low of 59.7 recorded in the first half of March, according to the final results released on March 25th. The main driver was rising worries about inflation, with respondents expecting inflation to be at 5.4% over the next 12 months. That's the highest reading since November 1981. The final value of 59.4 for March puts the MSCI 5.4% below its final reading of 68.2 in February 2022 and 30% under its value of 84.9 just one year ago in March 2021. Respondents mentioned inflation throughout the survey, whether the questions concerned personal finances, the economic outlook or buying conditions. In fact, over the past 50 years, concerns about falling living standards were only higher during the worst recessions in this period of 1978 to 81 and in 2008. Richard Curtin, the chief economist for the University of Michigan Surveys of Consumers, observed when asked to explain changes in their finances in their own words, more consumers mentioned reduced living standards due to rising inflation than any other time except during the two worst recessions in the past 50 years, from March 1979 to April 1981, and from May to October 2008. In the preliminary results for March, personal finances were expected to worsen in the year ahead by the largest proportion of respondents since the survey started in the mid-1940s. The final result shows further deterioration in sentiment, with 32% of respondents now expecting to be worse off a year from now. As a result of increased expectations about rising prices and diminished expectations about income growth, half of all respondents' households anticipate that their inflation-adjusted real incomes will decline in the year ahead. The only aspect of the economy about which respondents were upbeat was the job market. They were slightly more likely to expect that the unemployment rate will fall further than rise by 30% versus 24%. And Curtin commented, strong job growth will continue to put upward pressures on wages, resulting in high income and stronger job prospects. This strength will act to expand consumer demand and ultimately lead to another cycle of price and wage increases. These factors represent the necessary but not sufficient condition for the development of inflationary psychology as a self-fulfilling prophecy. And he continued, prevention of inflationary psychology is much less costly 
before it becomes ingrained in the economic behaviour of consumers and firms, confidence that economic policies will resolve the problem is essential. Unfortunately, half of all consumers unfavourably assess current policies, more than three times the 16% who rated them favourably. And in the final survey for February, many respondents indicate that aggressive actions are necessary right now to avoid the potential establishment of an inflationary psychology that will act to form a self-fulfilling prophecy. However, many worried that the Federal Reserve had missed opportunities to nip inflation in the bud at its earliest stages. And so the S&P 500 notched a second weekly win on Friday as late buying in tech propelled the broader market into the green, shrugging off fresh worries about an oil fuel rise of inflation. A turnaround in oil prices added to inflation jitters following reports that Iranian-backed Houthi missiles hit an Aramaco oil facility in Saudi Arabia. The news stoked further worries about supply shortages and offset earlier optimism after the EU failed to reach consensus on joining the US in banning imports of Russian oil. The WTI closed up 0.21% to 11258 The S&P 500 rose 0.51%, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 0.44% and the Nasdaq slipped 0.16%. Investors left it to a late chance to buy the dip in tech, helping the sector end well off its session lows despite a surge in Treasury yields on expectations for the Federal Reserve to move more aggressively on rate hikes to stem inflation. Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta Platforms all found support to end in the green, but Microsoft was the exception, closing below the flat line, though well off its session lows. Banking stocks, which benefit from a rising rate environment by boosting returns on their loan products, were up sharply. Wells Fargo rose 2.4% to 52.56, while Citigroup was up 0.57% to 5674. Share prices have been supported by Global Flash Purchasing Managers Index data for March this week, showing the world economy was broadly resilient. But the longer-term economic outlook is making investors cautious. Yesterday's PMI data survey, which paints an upbeat profile for the US macro trend, shows that the initial estimate for the US Composite Index, which is a survey based on a GDP proxy, accelerated to an eight-month high in March. The 58.5 print is well above the neutral 50 mark and signals a solid expansion trend. Manufacturers and service providers registered stronger upturns in activity, largely supported by pent-up demand and the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, market economists said. Firms also noted that less severe supply disruption and job creation allowed firms to set up production. The latest weekly update on US jobless claims support the upbeat PMI data. Indeed, new filings for unemployment benefits last week fell to the lowest level since 1969. US businesses are not laying off workers because they know the enormous challenges they're facing in filling open positions, said Ryan Sweet, a senior economist at Moody's Analytics. And a research note from economists at Jefferies, that's an investment bank, advises that the labour market is extremely strong and jobless claim data is exactly the sort of evidence that has given the Fed confidence that they can raise rates more quickly to battle inflation. Overall demand for labour is strong and there are no reasons to believe that this will change any time soon, barring another wave of a new COVID variant. Barclays cut its 2022 World Economic Growth Forecast this week to 3.3%, while traders have ramped up short bets. The US dollar inched higher against a basket of major currencies on Friday, a third straight day of gains. The DXY ended up to 98.81, while the euro was slightly lower, down 0.12% to 1.0983. As geopolitical tensions kept rising globally and the Fed continues to send hawkish messages to the markets, the greenback looks set to resume the ascent following some consolidation, with the overall uptrend staying intact. The one thing everybody can agree on is inflation is going to be longer lasting and a lot of that will be sticky and that will complicate what central banks do, said Ed Moyer, senior market analyst at Onda in New York. You will probably see the dollar lead the charge with rate hikes, Europe will lag and that interest rate differential should provide some support for the dollar. 
Demand for safe haven assets, including gold and the Swiss franc, remained resilient as the conflict in Ukraine continued. Moscow on Friday signalled scaling back its ambitions in Ukraine to focus on territory claimed by Russian-backed separatists as Ukrainian forces went on the offensive, recapturing land on the outskirts of the capital Kyiv. Spot gold sat at 1.957 an ounce, that's down 0.23% on the day, as a spike in US Treasury yields sent gold prices skidding, although the yellow metal held on to a weekly gain of more than 1% on the back of geopolitical tensions fed by the war in Ukraine and inflation concerns that had Americans more worried than during the 1980s and 2008 recessions. Friday's sliding gold came as the 10-year US Treasury note rose by 4.8%, adding to Thursday's 3.5% gain and pressurising bullion, which is of course non-yielding. Gold typically thrives in the environment of heightened political and economic fear, and the war in Ukraine and the runaway US price pressures had fed both of those. Craig Erlum Analyst at online trading platform Onia posted that gold will likely continue being, quote, well supported against the backdrop of sky high inflation and immense uncertainty. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're heading for record highs, which we currently sit a little more than 5% below, Elam said, referring to COMEX all time highs of 2,121 for gold. But as is the case more broadly right now, the main catalyst continues to be the constant flow of headlines, which will continue to determine the path of travel for the yellow metal. The blowback from the war in Ukraine has only just started to rock the global economy. There's a long road ahead, and it's too early to make high confidence forecasts. But preliminary data for March suggests that growth still has the upper hand for now. But despite these update numbers, it's premature to assume that the economy will dodge a business cycle bullet. That assessment, or rejecting it, will take several months. And meanwhile, as Capital Spectator outlined earlier this week, recession risk has risen recently, largely due to the confluence of surging inflation and various global shocks unleashed by the war in Ukraine. But high recession risk has yet to reach the tipping point, although the potential for trouble has surely increased relative to a month ago. There's still room for debate about what's to come next. The challenge is that economic conditions are subject to radical and perhaps dramatic changes in the weeks ahead due to the blowback from Russia's invasion of Ukraine and elevated inflation. An added factor of uncertainty, some economists say, are changes in the forces of growth and contraction. The long era of low inflation, suppressed volatility and easy financial conditions is ending, said Mark Carney, a former head of the Bank of England. It's being replaced by more challenging macro dynamics in which supply shocks are as important as demand shocks. US pending home sales, for example, a forward looking indicator based on contract signings dropped 4.1%. The readings showed a decline for the fourth month in a row and sales decreased by 5.4% year over year from February 2021. The spike in mortgage rates beginning in January and further rising in February generated of the decline. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage climbed 73 basis points from December 2021 to February 2022. And additionally, the median monthly payment takes up more of a consumer's income, indicating that the labour market is becoming more expensive. The spike is coming at a suboptional time, since spring is typically a busy time for home buying. Another complication is that the US economy is heading into a period of elevated macro risks with a deaccelerating growth rate. Some current now cast for first quarter GDP activity anticipate a sharp slowdown in output that suggests economic activity will come to a virtual stop. The Atlanta Fed's GDP now model is predicting that quarter one GDP will increase by a tepid 0.9% in the first three months of 2022 based on the March 24 estimate. That's a dramatic slowdown from Q4's red-hot 7% surge. That's an analyzed rate. Over in the UK, Britain's FTSE 100 ended higher on Friday and marked their third straight weekly gain on strengths in commodity-linked shares and consumer staples, although worries about high inflation, slowing economic growth, kept sentiment in check. After falling as much as 0.35%, the blue chip FTSE rose 0.21% to 7,483, led by energy stocks and large dollar earning companies, including spirit maker Diago 
and British American tobacco. The mood took a hit as data showed Britons cut back on their shopping in February and consumer confidence levels tumbled this month, while accelerating inflation cast a shadow over the world's fifth biggest economy. Inflation is really becoming more sticky and the war in Ukraine and the turmoil in commodity markets are adding fuel to the fire, said Peter Garnery, head of equity strategies at Saxo Bank. The rise in commodity prices is a cause for concern because they can impact operating margins for companies. While the commodity-heavy FTSE 100 has been buoyed by surging oil prices this week, mid-cap stock snapped its two-week winning streak amid concerns over a dent in economic growth. Oil majors Shell and BP rose 1.4 and 0.6 respectively, as crude prices gained following reports of that missile strike in Saudi Arabia. The domestically focused mid-cap index rose 0.3%, with real estate stocks leading gains. Discount retailer B&M European Value Retail fell nearly 3.6% after Credit Suisse downgraded the stock to neutral, while the overall retail index edged 0.2% higher. And Petro Pavos stock slumped 16.1% after the listed gold miner said it would miss an interest payment due on Friday after Britain froze the assets of its main lender, Gazprom Bank. In Europe, equities saw modest gains, with investors staying cautious as energy prices remained elevated after the recent rally, while geopolitical tensions surrounding the Russian-Ukraine conflict persist. Natural gas futures were up 2.68% to 5.546. On the data front, the IFO business climate in Germany plunged to 90.9 in March versus last month's 98.5 and the consensus estimates of 94.2. In the accompanying statement, the Institute highlighted that the economy faces uncertain times, while the industry supply chain issues have worsened. Still, the pan-European stock 600 retained a bullish tone, adding more than 0.1% on the day to 453.54, with losses for banks and some defensive stocks offsetting gains in energy, basic materials and technology names. Risk-on trades have abated somehow after a Russian negotiator at talks with Ukraine said the two sides have come closer together on secondary issues but are not moving forward on key ones. European shares ended a choppy session slightly higher on Friday but were down on the week as investors worried about the fallout from the Ukraine-Russia conflict while a rally in the commodity sector kept a lid on declines. Some late weaknesses have seen equities fall back but overall the rally in equities is still going, said Chris Beauchamp, chief market analyst at online trading platform IG. Nervousness remains, but equities have moved through the week without giving back too much ground. After two weeks of the gains that saw it rise more than 7%, the stock's 600 lost 0.2% this week, as lofty energy and commodity prices from sanctions on Russia fanned inflation fears and stoked worries about an economic growth slowdown. And the US will work to supply liquefied natural gas to the European Union this year to help it wean off Russia's energy supplies, Western leaders said, as Russia warned payment in rubles for natural gas exports was just days away, exacerbating supply shortage worries. Germany said it has made significant progress to reducing its exposure to imports of Russian gas, oil and coal. And Europe's basic materials sector is up a whopping 20% so far this year, and the energy index is 15% higher. The Ukraine crisis is likely to reduce prospects for global growth in the coming year, US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned on Friday. German business morale deteriorated in March due to worsening supply chain issues resulting from high petrol prices, but the country is not facing a recession in the first quarter due to the Ukraine war, the IFO Institute said on Friday. Equities are seen as a relatively good hedge in the case of inflation, but the type of inflation that we're seeing currently is supply shock, which is unlike the demand destruction caused by COVID-19, said Elwin de Groot senior market economist at Rubberbank. In a broad sense, you can question whether companies can sail through this without any damage. Following a solid bounce in the US, Asian stock markets traded mostly in positive territory on Friday, albeit they finished another choppy week in a mixed tone. Japan's Nikkei 225 inched up 0.14% to 28,149, with data released earlier in the day showing that the Tokyo Consumer Price Index for March grew 1.3%, 
and the Tokyo Core CPI grew 0.8% year on year. The CPI Tokyo excluding food and energy grew 0.2% month on month. The gap between the Fed's recent hawkish stance and the Bank of Japan's more dovish stance has sapped the yen, which is nearly a six-year low against the dollar. The yen weakness could also potentially spur yuan depreciation, according to Society Generale strategist Albert Edwards. South Korea's KOSPI edged up 0.1% to 2,729, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was down 0.247%, 21,404, while China's Shanghai Composite slid 1.17% to 3,212. The impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24, including elevated and volatile material costs, continues. The US also warned that Russian President Vladimir Putin could resort to dangerous methods, such as using biological, chemical or nuclear weapons, as its military campaign struggles and Western sanctions continue to bite. Meanwhile, although the 10-year US yield was still near levels last seen in 2019, key parts of the US Treasury yield curve continues to flatten or are inverted. The moves are leading to debate as to whether the bond market is signalling a steep economic slowdown or even a recession ahead. The yield on the two-year Treasury note is set for its biggest quarterly advance since 1984. And while the price action in Treasuries has been brutal, that does not mean a decade-long bull market in bonds is over, De Carly trading founder Carly Garner told Bloomberg. Inflation is the story now, but inflation has tended to be something which can change very quickly. It spikes and then it violently and quickly reverses the other way and generally triggers a recession while we're at it, she said. Now, the Australian share market rallied to a two-month high to finish the week, supported by strong gains from the major banks and miners. The ASX 200 closed the week 111.8 points or 1.5% higher at 7,406 after climbing 0.3% on Friday and hitting its highest level since January the 18th. Despite dipping slightly on Monday, the local share market rallied through the back of the week, supported by a rise in both metals and energy prices. BHP Group led the gains, advancing 7.6% over the five sessions as the price of oil and base metals rose. Rio Tinto rose 5.9% to 16687 while Fortescue Metals climbed 3.8% to 1927 the major banks supported those gains. Westpac climbed 0.4% to 2375. NAB firmed 1.4% to 3166. And ANZ rose 0.1% to 2761. But CBA dipped 0.3% to 10592. Macquarie Group advanced 1.6% to 10787. And Morgan Stanley analyst Andre Stadnik raised his price target on the shares to $245 from $242 earlier in the week, estimating its commodities and global markets businesses is set to cash in on a rise in trading activity and volatility. AVZ Minerals soared 24.6% to $1.14 in its first week elevated to the S&P ASX 200. The Lithium Explorer led broad gains from other miners of the battery mineral. Lion Town Resources climbed 15.7% to $1.92. Pilbara Minerals were 14.6% higher to $3.21. Alchem 10.6% to $11.01. And Mineral Resources 5.1% to $48.69. Base metal miners were also strong with IGO up 13.8% to $13.68. South 32 up 5.8% to $5.10 and Sandfire Resources up 6.5% to $5.71. Unity Group shares climbed 15.9% to $4.75 after receiving a takeover bid from Macquarie Asset Management and PSP Investments, which rivaled an offer from Morrison & Co. Brickworks advanced 9.9% to 23.97 after reporting a strong first half result and healthcare stocks led the market losses with CSL down 2.3% to 264.81 ResMed down 9.8% to 31.58 Fisher and Paykel were 11.6% lower to 22.82 and Medibank Private were 4.1% lower to 306 and Telex Pharmaceuticals 17.6% to 4.21 
Asset managers were also facing pressure during the week. The Platinum Asset Management down 6.7% to $2.10. Pendle Group down 5.9% to $4.50. Janus Henderson down 3.7% to $46.42. And Magellan Financial Group down 9.8% to $14.20. And finally, in crypto land, the Bitcoin price rallied to around $45,000 US for the first time since March as crypto enthusiasts kept re-entering the game after a slide toward $37,000 earlier in the month. However, the largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization may need some extra impetus to overcome the mentioned barrier, strengthened by the descending 20-week SMA. Bitcoin whales, though, have been accumulating the flagship cryptocurrency ever since Russia started invading Ukraine. Addresses with 1,000 to 10,000 Bitcoins have seen the amount of coins held within their wallets jump by 8.3% since then. According to on-chain analytics firm Santiment, the 2,203 addresses are at a one-year high, while holding between 44.2 million and 440.2 million worth of the flagship cryptocurrency each. The firm detailed that this group, along with the group of addresses holding between 100 and 1,000 Bitcoin, has historically foreshadowed price moves. Other data appears to suggest the flagship cryptocurrency's price is ready to move in the near future. As Crypto Globe reported, nearly 2.5 billion worth of the cryptocurrency has been moved off of popular cryptocurrency exchanges at a time in which the supply of Bitcoin at these platforms reached a three-year low, suggesting potential for a significant price rise. Market observers have suggested the price of Bitcoin could be ready to rally based on its low supply on exchanges. To Stefan Ovalet, Chief Executive FRNT Finance, the low supply may mean Bitcoin is ready to break out. He said that if there's a lot of Bitcoin on exchanges, then people are ready to sell. On the other hand, when Bitcoin is taken off exchanges and moved into private wallets, there's a significant smaller supply availability on the marketplace, which means rising demand could lead to higher prices. Bitcoin has notably been trading sideways over the last few months as it seemingly stuck within the tight trading range. Despite enduring a sell-off at the time Russia started invading Ukraine, the cryptocurrency quickly recovered to re-enter its range. So should this moving average give up, the Bitcoin US dollar pair could be targeting 50,000 US. But that psychological level will be tested for the first time this year. And it will be interesting to see if it gets there. We shall see. But standing back, you can see once again that the dynamics of uncertainty continue to rage. The inflation question, the interest rate question, the consumer confidence question, and the broader question of whether a recession is coming yet. All of those suggest to me that the markets will remain in uncertain territory for quite some time. And that's before I get to the Russia-Ukraine situation and the broader fallout from that. Therefore, I think that people are buying the dip, but the trajectory is still extremely uncertain. And most of the major analysts that I see are also suggesting that the level of uncertainty is higher than it's been for a long, long time. And by the way, you can join my conversation with Damien Klassen from Nucleus Wealth next Tuesday as I discuss the dynamics of the markets with him on the live show at 8 p.m. Sydney time. Mark your diaries and join us for what will be a very interesting discussion. I should just mention it's been raining cats and dogs while I'm making this recording so I apologize if in fact there is some background noise from the massive rainstorm which is overhead at the moment. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.